everyone. Let's start this final project. So I'm going to share my screen and show you some stuff. Okay. So I've got my uh, proposed final project up there. I've got my score uh, and the instruments that I need down below in a split screen kind of deal. Um, and let's do it. So the first screen that you'll see on Sibelius when you start up the software is the quick start uh, window here. And as you know, um, we've done this in class, but I'm going to walk you through it again very quickly. Here is the, uh, the blank uh, default. I'm going to select that, um, double click that. And uh, I've got my blank score. And I can then uh, pop in my instruments this way by hitting I. And then uh, put them in this way. Um, and go through it. You could alternative, alternatively go back to that uh, startup screen uh, by hitting Command N, or it's just, it'll come up automatically. But here I've got my uh, startup screen again, blank, and then uh, I hit it once, and um, I can start this way as well. So you have uh, several ways to do the same thing. Um, Page size, uh, try not to do letter because uh, your score is going to become crowded very quickly. Again, tabloid, which is a larger size, 11 by 17, and we're going to keep it on portrait. Um, then house style, just keep it the same. Change instruments, yes. Uh, so I'm going to go into, you know, I'll just show you a couple. Piccolo, add to score, um, and flute add to score, et cetera, and you go through what's needed. And so you can look at your instrument list down here and uh, uh, draw from that. Okay, so I'll put this over here and do a couple more. And the way that we're doing this um, is we're gonna double up the, on the score, we're gonna have two flutes on one staff like you see over here, okay? Um, so this says flutes one and two and piccolo piccolo is its own staff flutes one and two put them on one staff two on one um and then oboe one and two right and so you just need one um of those in your score and you're going to put uh, the both players in that one staff um all right and you go through them and you pop them in that way all right and so uh remember that the clarinet and e flat is not on common instruments uh You'd have to go up here in this drop down box and click band instruments for your E flat clarinet and then add to score and you've got your E flat clarinet. As I said in class, that's important because um, when you click transpose score button, I'll show you that a little bit later, um, your instruments are going to respect the, the transposition level that uh, they are default uh, set up to in this dialog box here. And so if you just like, let's say you put in the B flat clarinet here instead of E flat, and then like just change the name by typing it in later, uh, it's going to transpose to the incorrect uh, level or interval, and therefore also the wrong key, uh, the wrong key signature. So that's kind of important. That's kind of a pain if you do that. So this is an important step uh, deceptively. So anyway, um, I'm going to go back to common instruments and, you know, you just go through them and pop them in accordingly, brass, right? We want two of the horns and Fs because uh, you're going to, in your score, have uh, four horns, two for every staff. Let me know if that doesn't make sense um, and I can explain a little bit better. So I'm just going to hit OK. Let's say I did all my instruments and I have them in following the final project uh, PDF. And let's say I got them all in there. And you'd, you'd see a lot more than this, like you'll see in a bit. <clears throat> but then uh, the Ravel piece is in 2 4. So you can go and put your time signature in there. Um, tempo text, they don't have Madore, like the French. So you have to type that in. I'll show you how to do that. Metronome mark, don't really worry about it. I put in, um, I'll show you later, but I put in 60 to the quarter. Um, that's a good tempo marking. You don't need that, but for in terms of playback, so you can hear the instruments, the MIDI mock-up, it's a good way to go about it. So quarter note equals 60 or somewhere in that realm. Uh, key signature is uh, F sharp minor. 
uh, right? It's, it's a piece in F sharp minor. Uh, you can click A major, that's fine. That's gonna get the same result, okay? And so there you have it. Uh, title, um, put in your title. And so um, stick to the title here. You know, there, there are times to be creative. This is not one of them. Um, if you put in some kind of crazy title, like, you know, I'm not going to take off points. <laughs> I don't really care, but um, you want to put in our title here just to keep it kind of uniform. Composer, put in your name, you know, your name, etc. Lyricist, don't worry about it. Um, copyright, you don't need to worry about that. If you want to put it in, um, you would write copyright. Uh, and then do option, um, sorry, control. Oh, they're not letting me do it. I guess it's already like preset. I'll do that later in the score. Um, and I believe that's all you need to do uh, for this particular method. And then I'm going to hit create. And it's going to create my score. And um, you go from there. But I've already got it done for us. So here, here's my creation. And you hear, here you'll see all the instruments uh, that we need as listed here. Okay. And I'll, I'll put this up on Canvas so you can see it. Um, let's see. One important thing to add is, uh, as I mentioned, transpose score. You want to put. You want. You're going to want to put that in your uh, piece. Right. That's an important thing. Transpose score. How do I do that? All right, so a couple ways to do it. Uh, the fastest way is to hit con uh, Command T, and that's a technique text, and uh, then click on your score, and then type in transposed score, you know, and then you can then go in and double click that and go under to to text, and then change that to bold if you like. You don't have to. I just like to do that so it's more legible you know uh it pops a little bit more transpose score you can even change the size the size that is here is 5.5 but uh you know if you want it even more uh, legible you can you can just hit this uh up arrow increase the size of that font that's a little too big i think but uh hey you know you can also go in the box and type in a, a font size you want um, I think that's acceptable, 10. I, I'd probably go down to 8 or something, you know? It, it d doesn't really matter. You just want it to be uh, uh, re legible, right? Um, so here's my full score. I've got my time signature as the Ravel. I've got all my instruments. Um, I've got my key signature. And uh, you'll also notice that my key signatures are appropriate for the instruments that are transposing, right? So the, the original piece is F sharp minor, um, and I've got F sharp minor, but the pieces that need to transpose are transposed accordingly. So for example, this E flat clarinet um, has its key signature. You know, the English horn has uh, its key signature, right? And, and so on and so forth. Um, the B flat clarinets have an uh, additional two flats, um, taking them up a whole step. So what does that make them in G sharp minor, right? That's the key signature they need. And it, it goes through, here's G sharp minor again, right? And the alto sax, um, in, uh, in its key signature, right? So they're all correct. And, uh, how did I do that? Well, if you go to the home page up on top here. Um, these are the different kind of tabs for different possible pages you can work from. And you can, you can toggle through those and have fun exploring them. Um, but on the home page, all you have to do is click transposing score and uh, it will transpose your instruments uh, as necessary. So the English horn, um, you'll see that change and the clarinet in E flat two change to, uh, this is the C score uh, or concert pitch score, non-transposing. And then if I click transposing, it takes me to where I need to be, which is our transpose score. So you just remember to click that transposing score button on the home page, and you're good to go. Now it makes the English horn um, in C sharp minor 
uh, a fifth up from written, which is F sharp minor. So English horn, if you remember, uh, sounds a fifth lower than written. And so if they're written in C sharp minor, they're going to sound F sharp minor, you know, and so on and so forth for the, the clarinet and E flat. All right, and uh, all these instruments. So that's good to go. The other thing I want to tell you about is uh, we selected um, one flute, but we've got two players on that single flute staff, right? We've got two players. They're going to be um, sharing a staff, not sharing instruments. That's important to know. So there's going to be um, in this score that you're creating in your imaginary orchestra, um, there's going to be two flute players, two flute players um, playing their respective parts. They're just reading, well, they'll, they'll be reading from their own parts, but on the score, we pair them up. And so they're both on this staff. And so a little bit about how to notate that when you first see your score after you create it, it's just going to say flute. And so what you need to do here, uh, which I've already done, is double click the name of the instrument and change it to flutes one and two. And so when you start your score, it'll just say flute. All right. And make sure you do that. You change that. You edit it. Just double click it and then type in it. Flutes one and two. And they're not transposing, right? They're concert pitch instruments, so you can just keep them like that. And so you have to go through um, each each instrumental uh, family and unique woodwind and brass, etc., and just change them according to how we're doing this. Oboes one and two, type it in there. English horn, you don't have to worry about. Clarinet and E flat, you don't have to worry about. But clarinets, um, you're going to have to add the S for clarinets and basically type in uh, what you see there in blue highlighted. Um, that's what I recommend. Uh, if you prefer to do it another way, um, I don't mind. It's fine. If, like if you had flute, flute, and just had two staves for e one, one staff for each flute part, flute one, have its own staff, and then do another flute, flute two, and have another staff. That's fine. That's fine. You can do that. It's just a little bit crowded. You'll see. Uh, with, with such a massive orchestra, um, it's often common to have them share a staff. That's why, uh, because it's just the score looks riddled with part, with parts, and so it just gets big, 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 and big. And so that's why we're doing it. All right, um, your choice on that though. Horns, um, horns one and three in F. I recommend the uh, this particular method where they're integrated or overlapped or um, uh, it, uh, set up like this, like the devil horns, right? Um, uh, you can do it like this, one and three and F and two and four and F. We talked about this in class, um, certainly possible. Uh, you could also do one and two and F and then three and four and F, although this is the sort of traditional method. And we talked about why that is, and it's because horns two and four were originally in different keys, like lower keys. And it's just a practice that's still done today. Trumpet one uh, and then trumpet two, uh, two and three on a staff below. I did that because, as I said in class, if you put all three trumpets on one staff, it kind of gets crowded and it looks like triads. That's fine. You can do it. But you'll see, perhaps, as you go that um, maybe you want to write like three trumpets and have their own individual rhythms. And so if you have got three voices on one staff with different rhythms, it gets crowded and confusing. And so I do it like this. Uh, you can also do it uh, one staff per trumpet, one, two, three on their own staff. That's fine, okay? Just keep in mind that it, it looks busy and the, the uh, score is going to be crowded and it's just a lot uh, on the page. So this is what I do. Um, trombones one and two and then the bass trombone on its own, uh, own staff. Um, you'll see composers do it many different ways. And look, we're talking about 300, 300 years of orchestral scores and, you know, different countries, different types of composers. And so sometimes they'll write just trombones um, and then you'll see all three on one staff and there's no distinction between tenor and bass. That's possible. And then the bass player or the, the uh, trombone players, 
they just know what it is. The lowest voice is the bass trombone and the upper two parts of the tenors. You know, it's pretty obvious. Um, so you don't need to specify tenors one and two and then bass, but I'm doing that sort of as a pedagogical thing so you can see that and it makes sense. But there you have it, tuba, percussion, one, two, three. Now we'll talk about percussion next week, uh, Monday, and maybe a little bit on Wednesday. Uh, we'll see. I'm going to try to do it cleanly, but, uh, you know, things sometimes get overlapped. Um, we'll talk about this a little bit later. Usually the timpanist, the timpani player, has their own st uh, staff, and they, they stick to that. Um, they don't change instruments. Um, same thing with mallets. Uh, marimba, marimba players, they will stay often on the marimba for the whole piece or the movement uh, and then change up later. Uh, we'll talk about it more, but like if you're going to use timpani for this piece, have one staff and um, dedicate that staff to timpani for the whole piece. Don't have your timpanist play like timpani and then grab auxiliary percussion. Uh, it's rare to do that. I guess it's possible, but traditionally that's the case, okay? So timpani, timpanists just play the timpani drums, marimbists um, or other mallet percussion players, xylophone players, they'll often just play their, uh, their um, mallet percussion instruments. And then like you'll have an extra percussionist do like the auxiliary, like your, um, um, an auxiliary percussion would be triangle or um, maybe like a set of toms or like drums, um, a, like a, a multi set of drums, something like that, or like wind chimes or, you know, paper, there's all sorts of different cool percussion instruments that are auxiliary. Uh, and they're usually specified and, um, organized like that. So we'll talk more about that on Monday, but, uh, right now I've got one, two, three percussionists and I'm good to go. My two harps there and the strings. Contra bass, you could call it bass. Uh, you could call, you could use bassi, the Italian. You can say you can put these all in Italian. Viole, violini, it's fine. <laughs> but this is the English, so there it is. And don't forget, you'll have to type in and change your instruments and just double click them and uh, pluralize them. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. If you need further explanation, I'm here for you. And I'll see you in class during our workshop, so I'll help you get this absolutely clear and uh, looking beautiful, okay? So I've got all my instruments, all my keys transposed the right way. Thankfully, um, Sibelius does it for us, so that's helpful. Although, um, I will say that that kind of eliminates the knowledge, the need for the knowledge to do it, but uh, y'all are uh, experts at this now, so there we have it. There's my score. Now let's get into the music finally. And uh, so we know the piece. Here it is down here, okay? Beautiful, beautiful uh, classic Ravel. Gotta love that. Uh, the melody is in the outer parts here. And so when you're orchestrating, You've got to know what's the melody and what's the accompaniment. And so uh, orchestrate accordingly. And obviously you want to bring out that melody and beef it up and double that melody. And so you see it here in the eighth notes and the quarters here and going in, um, in this direction, right? In the outer parts, um, the inside stuff is the accompaniment. Now look, you could do this so many different ways, and that's the sort of beauty in this process. Um, and the other thing I want to say is uh, we want to respect the original, okay? Uh, I made an, an announcement about it because it was brought up in class. Um, hey, the question, could I get creative with this and like add measures of content or, or add to this, uh, extend the tertians out, extend, you know, Put a put a thirteenth chord above all this, and no, don't do it. Don't even think about it. Uh, while I love that kind of creativity and like inspiration, uh, this isn't the time or the place for that. Do that in your own piece. Uh, this is Ravel. We're not adding to it. We're not adding measures. We're not adding thirteenth chords on top of it. No, that's that's another context. Do that elsewhere. Uh, we're going to keep this. Uh, 
to the T, to the to the R for Ravel, if you will. All right, so just um, you're arranging the original. You're not creating uh, a composition on top or based on the original. That's that's another class. We've got to keep it as is and try to evoke the music that you see here uh, to the best of your ability. Um, okay, so we're trying to evoke Ravel, get to the essence of Ravel as best we can. We're not Ravel, okay? Uh, but we can certainly try to be and enjoy the process. So what did I do? What did I do to try to evoke the piece? Hey, you could do it a bunch of different ways. And that's, that's the challenge and the beauty in this. That's the art. And I, I decided to do uh, soprano saxophone and bassoon on that opening line. And so you can hear that. I did these two instruments. I, I love them both. They're gorgeous. And I thought that doubling would be effective because um, you get like the, they're both reed instruments. And I think they complement one another very effectively in this register. Um, this register for the soprano saxophone is uh, just perfect. It's on the staff. Uh, it's between the F and the F, as we said in class, which is the most comfortable range. Uh, that two octave range that was mentioned. Um, bassoon, uh, it's a little bit higher in its register, but um, it's it's still going to have that reedy quality. Um, it's going to project in that register. It's not quite as high as the rate of spring, so you know it's not up here. It's it's going to sound really good. Uh, nice and projected and the two together are going to create a special uh, distinctive uh, blend um, that I would love to hear and so well let's hear what the MIDI does at least that's all we've got at the current time here it is yeah and so you hear mostly bassoon in that case uh, but uh, I'd love to hear that live and perhaps we could do something in class at some point, but um, it takes time to do these live things. Um, I also added harp to that. Um, and why did I add harp to it? Well, you know, the original has a sort of fluttering effect. Uh, these internal notes, these 32nd notes, they give it like a, a wispiness, like a sort of like butterfly kind of sound, if you will. <laughs> um, there's there's a, a shimmer to it. There's a, there's a, a, like a light shimmer to it um, that is kind of special. And um, I wanted to kind of evoke that. And so this shimmer effect, this tremolo um, glitter, if you will, you know, whatever word you want to use. Um, I wanted there to be like a uh, a fluttering effect. And so I thought the harp would be great for evoking that tremolo. And so what I did in the harps, um, well, first of all, I doubled the, I doubled the melody in harp one. So harp one's gonna. You know, they're gonna uh, play that doubling with the woodwinds, the bassoon and the uh, soprano sax. Um, then to get that flutter effect, uh, I added, first of all, harp, and, and then I added clarinets. And I'll show you each part individually so you can see at least what I did with it. And of course, this is not the only way. It's just uh, what I decided to do at the given time to evoke this, uh, this flutter effect. And so harp two is gonna be um, alternating hands, so the, they're going to be playing that third just like this, uh, alternating on either side of the instrument. And so here you get the C sharp A and then C sharp A, and it just goes through the uh, 30 seconds accordingly. And so look, uh, look how I did this. So the, the inner parts uh, start with a C sharp and then go A, C sharp A. And so the inner parts have a stream of 30 seconds the whole time. And it doesn't quite look like it in the piano score because you're doing, it's sophisticated, it's Ravel. And so you get this first 30 second in the left hand. And then the second 
um, sorry, the next three are in the right hand. So you've got a little bit of uh, arranging to do, and this is the point, this is arranging. You've got enough to do with the given notes. So you can see why I prefer you not uh, add notes to what's given. Uh, just take what's given here and, and creatively arrange it accordingly. And so that's what I did. I put this C sharp right here, and I put this A right here in the harp, so they go, and then the left hand. So you're going right hand, left hand, right hand, left hand, alternating those um, 30 second notes accordingly. You can hear that. Okay, and that's pretty much how that's going to work out. And um, yeah, the two harps together. Hopefully you can hear this. And that captures it quite well. Now let's hear the clarinets. All right, so this is one way to do it. Um, clarinets one and two, they're tight. Um, they're stand partners, so they're they're going to be um, uh, well knowledgeable, uh, informed, very well informed as to who's playing what, uh, who's playing each part, and so. I split them uh, across the whole line. And uh, this is good because two reasons. It gives them the ability to breathe. Um, and it also gives them the ability to play the lines and the shifting registers uh, a little bit more effectively and prepare for that. Although I, you know, you could take this whole line and put it into the first clarinet. I'm sure it'd be okay, uh, but I decided to stagger them. And uh, so I had, the, you can see the colors here. I'll show you how to do that, but I just want to explain it first. And um, uh, let me just clear out some space here. Okay. Okay, this, okay. So in blue, it's the first clarinet. And in, in orange is the second clarinet. And I distinguish them by the one and the two. Um, and I typed that in. I hit Command T or Apple T. And then just, you know, it's just technique text. Doesn't matter what text you use, really. Uh, just try to avoid italics. Um, italics are usually for foreign languages, like Italian or, in this case, French. So, um, yeah, that's it. And just put them in and that tells the players or the, the conductor who's using, using this score, oh, the first clarinet's gonna play the top part with the stems going up, and then the, uh, the second clarinet's gonna play the bottom part with the stems down. I guess you could call it the soprano clarinet and the you know, alto clarinet, if you will. Clarinet one, clarinet two, and uh, that's what we did. And I just alternated them uh, based on the change of the pattern, and basically. I, um, if there is a change in the notes, um, I just gave it to the other player. So here you get all the same notes, the same third. And then here you get a, you get a different third, and so I gave it to the other player. And just alternating what the notes, what the groupings are to the players. So if there's a different pitch grouping, I just swapped them. So a, a different pitch third, I gave it to the other player. There's another third tremolo, so I gave it to the first player, etc. Here's another third, and so I kept it in that player because it's consistent. But you could do it any number of ways um, within, you know, reason. You know. But uh, this is what I did, um, and I think it works nicely. It's clear. Uh, there's nothing rhythmically hard about it. Uh, there's, you know, they're duplet rests. They're evenly distributed rests. Yeah, so it should work out fine. Um, I guess you could do this whole thing in one clarinet, it's fine. But since we're in an orchestral setting and you've got players, uh, it's often the case to just, hey, uh, divide them in some way that makes sense and is clear. Um, you know, I wouldn't divide it like across half of a beat or give them like something like this where they have like uh, an eighth note and a 32nd or some kind of weird division or strange uh, obscure or obtuse uh, division. Uh, um, we'll keep it pretty clear and kind of 
evenly equally divided across the measure. And so I think this is a good way to do it. And you can hear that. And it's kind of nice because if you were to stand close to them uh, when they play that, you can hear the sort of dialogue of uh, tremolo thirds um, as they play that. And it's nice. They kind of sometimes they overreach each other and they're kind of like climbing up this ladder, alter alternating the uh, uh, steps up the ladder, if you will. So that's what I did there. Um, that's that's what it is. OK, so that's all I have. And I'm happy with that. That's it. Um, that's how I would orchestrate, right? Less is more for sure. Um, here's the thing. It's piano, the dynamic level. So the more instruments you add, the, the kind of thicker and denser the texture gets. Um, and subsequently, often the volume increases uh, or the, the mass, there's more mass to the sound. Um, I didn't want mass here. I wanted delicate, like um, uh, a flaky croissant, you know, like <laughs> something delicate and um, fluffy. I didn't want massive um, heaviness. And so I kind of thinly orchestrated it. And so I did it like that. Uh, it's only later on where I would perhaps add to the texture and pile on instruments. All right. And so think about that, too, like here uh, later on in the piece, page three or five or whatever this is, page four of the score. Um, this is where I would start adding mass, uh, because with mass comes often the ability to play forte and the sense of more timbre, uh, more combinations of color. Um, and so I would I would withhold things. I would withhold um your mass until you need it you've got the full orchestra uh just hold off on it don't have everybody playing at the beginning less is more and you can certainly see here that um, um there's enough going on it's quite it's actually going to be sound quite full uh because there's so many there's actually already a lot of timbres you get the the sort of harp pluckiness um and then the you know the the readiness of these uh, these reeds, the the uh, woodwinds, and then you get the clarinets playing their uh, tremolos. <clears throat> it's already enough. Okay, um, you could even do this. You could even take out the harps, and that's also a good start. Why not? I I think you you've got enough. You've got the undercurrent. You got that flutter in the clarinets the flutter, and then you've got the doubled melody in the woodwinds, that would be quite enough uh, if you had just that. All right, so just giving you different things to think about. A um, couple more things, and then I'll wrap it up here. So first of all, make sure that all your instruments have the uh, do et expressif, um, the soft and expressive uh, French. Uh, pop that in across all the instruments, make sure that's there so that they know uh, what the, the manner of play is. Um, and that's important. Also the dynamics, put that in there, piano, um, and that'll appear in the parts as well. We'll talk about parts later, extracting parts, but make sure all your dynamics and your, um, your expressive text, the way to, the way to play is there. How do I do the, uh, expressive text easy just hit apple e apple e or command e and then um pop in your text now this um this version of sibelius um not, not only does it have the previous issues uh of the previous versions uh, i don't want to get into them but the software has a lot of quirks that are annoying they don't fix the problems of course <laughs> um they focus on like new hotness like oh it's got a new feature without fixing the bugs one of the bugs in this one in my opinion is when when you select your uh expression text you're going to go command e fine my cursor's blue and all right i'm going to put my text right here um often that cursor will disappear like what it just 
You see, it just disappeared. Where is it? It's not blinking. So you just watch out for that. Um, okay, there it is. So you've got to put it, um, let me see if I can figure this out here. Yeah, there. it's kind of fussy where it, it wants you to put it. Weird, right? So you'll find that it's, a, it's just a bug uh, in the software. There's a lot of them. We don't have time to get into them, but uh, maybe you'll discover them as well. And so anyway, Apple E, Command E, you've got your expression text. What is expression text? It's italicized font and often foreign language. All right, and so you, you type it in and um, good to go. It's not gonna change how the MIDI plays it back. Uh, I don't think, unless you write swung, but it, yeah, it's, you know, more for like real players. But yeah, you'd play that soft and expressive. Make sure that's there. For the dynamics, also, same thing. Command E, or Apple E, and that's also going to get you the blinking expressive text cursor. How do you do piano? Uh, command P. Hold Command down and hit P, or whatever uh, dynamic you need. Hold Command down and do uh, F, right? And that's the font you need for uh, the, the dynamics, okay? So that's good. I'll say a couple things here. Um, your rests for the different layers, uh, make sure they look like this, um, where you have a clear uh, visual legible rest. Um, and let's talk now about those layers. How do you do them? Uh, we mentioned it briefly in class, but I, I don't think I went in enough detail about it. Um, so over here on the keypad, you've got these numbers on the bottom. They're your layer numbers. And you can see there's up to four layers. Um, this is what you're going to click uh, to start your layering. So let me show you. For example, if I wanted to, uh, in the oboes, uh, create some notes here. Uh, I'm going to start with layer one. The default layer is blue layer one, voice one. And so it's already kind of built in for me. I've got my, I'm going to put in a rest. I'm going to make it look like below with the 30 second notes, all right? So I've got my eighth rest in there and I go through and I pop in my notes, fine. Um, the oboe is a C instrument, so I'm going to write it in its the original key. All right, so anyway, there's my oboe part. Um, and it, it came in uh, with stems down. I'm going to put stems up because I've got another instrument to put in on this very staff. And so let's say that's it. I put in my dynamics and my, you know, expression text. And I'm going to put in player one here. I'm going to do command T and see it. It disappeared on me. You know, told you. <laughs> so here's one. I'm typing in one. So that means player one. And so that lets the, um, the conductor and the oboists know Hey, who's playing what? Is it player one on the top or player two? You know, usually it is player one on the top, player two on the bottom, but still you want to specify. And so there I've got it. Now, how do we do the second layer? How do I do this? Well, it's easy. You go down here and click any other color, two or three or four. I usually go with three because you'll find that um, the colors one and three they work out in terms of like the spacing best. Um, some doublings like uh, one and two, if I were to make like quarter notes that are supposed to line up um, with one and two, they're gonna be staggered a little bit. The quarter notes will be automatically staggered um, and you don't want that, you want them to look vertically uh, in line. So because of that, I default one and three. Um, that'll, you'll see as you go. It's just a good method. So um, you wanna uh, just do odd numbers for these colors, these layers. Um, it's not that important, but that, that's just why I do it. You'll see. All right, so here's my orange third layer. I'm gonna put down a quarter note. Um, oops, and let me do that again, All right? And I'm going to drag that down with my arrow while it's already highlighted. 
in the arrow key and make sure it's legible. That's it. That way it can be read. It, Sibelius, um, it's, uh, I hate to say this, but it's not always that intelligent. Um, other software like Dorico is the default for layers. Um, it's going to have the, the, the two uh, rest or notes, they're going to just collide. And why would it do that? You know, it's like, the, dude, fix the old problems. You know, they don't fix their old bugs. Anyway, this isn't my soapbox episode here. <laughs> so I'm just going to move on from that. You have to drag it down to make it legible, which is very annoying, but that's how it is. All right. So then here's my second layer. Okay. And this is Oboe 2. And so Oboe 2, Oboe 2 is going to be on the G sharp and the E. And so you just pop in the notes, you know, et cetera. But you see how they're all, um, the beams are up, they're up beams. All you have to do is click one of them, one of the notes or the stems or like even a part of the stem and just hit X and that flips it for you. But as I said, Sibelius uh, is perhaps not the most uh, user friendly software. And you'll see that this there's a, a collision here uh, between the second layer and the first layer's rest. And so you just want to click it and drag and make it legible. Uh, that's fine. That's fine, too. I believe the default is to go with that. So there's at least, you know, um, a, just more space between the, the items. You could even put this one up here if you wanted to. That looks good. Um, perhaps it's a little bit too floaty and you want to keep um, it as it was written. Certainly you want the quarter rest to be um, legible. You could do that that's fine. Um, or you could do that. Uh, I don't really care. There's, there's a rule book on this if you want to see uh, called Behind Bars. Uh, it's a very good text about notation. Um, and they, they have a bit about this in there. Okay. Uh, but you, it's really acceptable to go either way for me. Um, I'm going to default in the most uh, legible, meaning giving myself like about you know, half an inch, if you will, of distance, uh, although it doesn't really matter, okay? Just make it legible. Certainly don't do this, you know, because uh, you can't, what is that, you know? So you've got to at least do that, maybe one more, you know, <laughs> they're both the same, right? Uh, try not to do that, <laughs> right? So just having fun with it, okay? So that's how you do your layers, and now I've got my layers, and I just need to put a two here to make sure that it's clear see it disappeared very annoying i might just click the note and then hit the command t and then hit two and and then drag it around and and your two and your one just put them kind of near where the notes are um you know don't obviously it's gonna automatically like avoid a collision because it's got magnetic layout that's sort of sibelius's uh cash cow or their their claim to fame you know uh so if you drag it it's going to automatically not collide with the note so it is there. That's one thing that's smart, but others aren't so much. The layers kind of suck. I wish they had magnetic layout for the layering, uh, but they don't. Anyway, you want to put your one somewhere near the note. Uh, certainly don't put it out there in, or, you know, out here. It's right within reason. And so that's reasonable, uh, you know, to the left of the start of it. That's reasonable, but less legible, you know, it, that's less legend you know put it up and all the um all the details the dynamics the expression markings the numbers for which player plays what for the upper layers they're going to go above right and then all of the the details the numbers the expression the dynamics for the lower part player two they're going to go below and so you can see that here all of my player one content is above and all my player two content is below okay so that's important to know. All right, hopefully this is uh, effective knowledge for you and helpful. I'm just gonna delete that because I don't want them playing yet. <laughs> but certainly you could, okay? And I want you to really enjoy this and uh, explore your creativity in evoking this Ravel uh, to the best of your creative ability, okay? Without adding and uh, creating a new composition.
right? We want to express the rebel uh, very clearly and explicitly. This is one way to do it. Okay, so I believe that's all I want to say. Um, maybe give you a couple ideas uh, about how to do, how to start this beyond what I've already given you. Um, as I said, less is more. But this melody here, beautiful stuff, great. It's like modal, there's parallel fifths. Uh, it's super cool, Ravel. Um, other ideas, uh, gosh, strings playing that melody, violins. You could have um, solo violinist with trumpet solo. That'd be great. Um, Flute and oboe is good. One particular um, um, doubling I like is oboe and trumpet. I, I think that's a really special doubling. Um, you might do oboe and uh, English horn for that melody. Uh, gosh, a lot of potential horn, let's say horn and clarinet and solo, that'd be great. Um, if you do horn and clarinet, um, you're going to want to write solo on the horn part so they know, or, or put one that's acceptable. I mean, it's, it's pretty clear what the melody is and who's bringing it out. One thing I want to add to this is that very detail, solo, um, and um, you typically put it like that you can put a comma after the solo you don't have to but okay solo that's one way to write it solo soft and expression expressive or you could even do this solo um soft and expressive like that and that means that tells the bassoonist to bring out the melody i think that's a nice thing um but you know the way it's orchestrated it's automatically going to uh project and, um, you know, but it's a nice thing to say, to put in there. Solo means, hey, this is your time to shine. And they'll play it with a little bit more expression uh, and um, individuality and uh, in a unique way, perhaps, uh, with more expression. That's a nice thing. That's gonna make, take this, it's gonna like fine polish this and take it to the next level. Harp, you could also put in solo. Um, and uh, they'll play it with a bit more expression and just kind of gives them the uh, laissez-faire, hands-off, um, to play a little bit more freely. And I think that's nice. Um, okay, trying to think of other things that I can tell you to help. Um, uh, concerning the accompaniment, that fluttering nature, clarinets, um, flutes, oboes, um, they all work nicely with a tremolo. Uh, just keep in mind, as you uh, increase your interval of tremolo, the, the difficulty becomes greater. The sound wave gets bigger. Or there's more of a difference between the sound waves, so it's, it becomes more like awkward. But the thing about it is these tremolos are all thirds. So thirds work beautifully as tremolos on woodwinds, any of them. Uh, I guess certain ones maybe not as easy as others, but you'd have to ask the player. But I think they're pretty good. And the way I did it is I staggered them enough so um, it's uh, distributed nicely, I, I believe. Um, uh, yeah, you could do some kind of tremolo in the strings. That would be nice. Uh, where they play the actual third fingered tremolo on that. We just write out 32nd notes uh, in the uh, in the strings. It's fine. That'd be nice. Maybe something with like uh, sordino mutes, right? That'd be really beautiful. Uh, harp's great. You can steal that idea. That's fine. It works. Uh, maybe something in percussion. Uh, I don't know, like a marimba playing the 32nd note. Um, uh, uh, a fluttering sound uh, with like a snare drum brushes, uh, you know, you can feel free to totally get creative with it, but don't change the notes. Don't add to the notes, just what's there. I want the notes and rhythm that you see on the Ravel. 
All right, so um, what else could you do? Anything in the brass? Um, sure, maybe the melody in trumpet and trombone, tenor trombone, and then chords, uh, some kind of like sustained uh, chords under here. You could do some kind of chorale in the brass. Uh, you'd have to know what the chords are here. This is uh, F sharp minor, C sharp minor, uh, D, uh, B minor, D major, E major, and do some kind of like uh, chorale, maybe um, with, with mutes, um, horns and mutes or something like that. That would be effective. Um, trying to think what else they could do. I don't know if I'd go growling, because uh, that's often like a forte dynamic there. Um, I don't know if I would go 32nd notes. Definitely, probably not. On some kind of double, double tonguing or single tonguing. No, nah, I'd avoid that. Um, so in brass, I would just like do maybe a chorale in the given rhythm uh, of the melody. You know, so put all this as a chord, put all that as a chord. That'd be kind of nice. So it'd be like... Down an octave, you know. Something like that would be nice in brass. All right, so you do the same in uh, saxophones. Uh, saxophones are very good at the tremolos. So you could put this kind of idea in the uh, inner saxophone parts, tenor and alto, and then soprano and uh, baritone could play the melody, you know, lots of different ways to do this. Okay, I'll leave it at that. Uh, if you have any questions, please contact me via email or see me after class. Uh, the next few classes, I'll do my best to uh, provide further ideas about how to orchestrate this. And um, I also want to point your attention to some of these additional chapters that we didn't exactly get to there's just a lot to do in orchestration, right? And I wanted to make sure you heard the instruments and uh, uh, all of us, all of us students had a chance to uh, present. Um, and what better way to learn than present and also uh, get practice in uh, presentation skills and all that. But uh, here, these chapters, scoring for strings, scoring for woodwinds and brass, they're very good. Um, but especially chapter 15, scoring for orchestra and the preparation of score and parts. These are good. They're gonna help get you geared up. And um, I will be presenting uh, just some details about that here and there over the next uh, couple weeks uh, to help you uh, in your scoring process, like ideas about how to, how to do these things effectively, okay? And of course, uh, I'm here uh, the whole time. So if you have any questions, let me know. And I look forward to seeing your awesome arrangement of this beautiful piece. Do listen to it a lot first. It's my suggestion. Um, make sure you listen to it an awful lot. Put it on loop and listen to it and uh, get to know it really well. Make sure that you're always bringing out the melody. That's number one. Uh, number two would be the internal accompaniment um right and so plan that way you might go through the whole piece highlighting the melody um at all times and then uh starting there and and then fleshing out your score um uh afterwards um so yeah i will uh i will see you in class guys take care and uh happy orchestrating and uh yeah that's it bye